morning to uh, introduce Dr. Nick Freudenberg. And um, Nick's one of those people who, whatever you uh, talk to him about almost anything, you find yourself in agreement. And, um, and it's great to have uh, somebody with his perspective on the, the larger issues that affect our um, population here with us this morning. He's a distinguished professor of public health in, at the City University of New York School of Public Health. And he also directs the New York City Food Policy Center at Hunter College. Um, Nick is founder and director of Corporations and Health Watch, an international network of activists and researchers that monitors the business practices of the alcohol, automobile, firearms, food and beverage, pharmaceutical, and tobacco industries, some of our best friends. His most recent book is Lethal But Legal, Corporations, Consumption, and Protecting Public Health. For more than 30 years, Dr. Freudenberg has assisted municipal agencies, nonprofit organizations, and others to develop, implement, and evaluate programs and policies to improve the health of New York City and to reduce inequalities in health. His areas of research include the impact of corporate practices on health, child obesity, food, and po food policy and health, municipal governance and health, urban health and health inequalities. His work has been funded by the NIH, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Open Society Institute, the CDC, and New York City Department of Health. It's really a great pleasure um, to introduce Dr. Nick Freudenberg. Thank you, Neil. And it's a... Uh, honor and privilege to be here this morning. Uh, I have deep ties with uh, the Institute and with many of you in the room, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And a special welcome to the viewers uh, at Beth Israel and in Kingston, and the viewer in Mumbai, India. Uh, you, you two are all welcome. So the topic I'm going to talk about today is uh, what are some of the ways that the tobacco, alcohol, and food industries affect the health of the people you serve? And what are some of the ways that you can take on the practices that address uh, those harmful practices? And I wanted to just say a little bit about the uh, images here. The first, uh, from Marlboro, is part of a global campaign by uh, Philip Morris International, the maker of Marlboro uh, around the world and also here in the United States. And their effort here is to encourage young people not to be indecisive, but to go for those cigarettes. And this is a global campaign actually designed here in New York City in the United States by the advertising agencies that Philip Morris International employs and looking to uh, encourage young people uh, to take some risks. The second, uh, by Smirnov Vodka, is part of their campaign to encourage uh, young women to drink flavored uh, vodka drinks, uh, a campaign that's been remarkably successful in reducing the disparity in drinking rates between young men and young women. That's one way to uh, eliminate disparities in health, which is to uh, bring the better off group down to the level of the worse off group. And the third image, I think, speaks for itself. And uh, one way to think about it is this little girl, uh, we didn't protect her by not passing our portion size limitation. And so she's now uh, at greater risk of obesity and diet-related diseases than uh, had we implemented those uh, recommendations. So uh, in this report that the World Health Organization put out a few years ago, they looked at the causes of what they call non-communicable diseases, what we call chronic diseases. Uh, there's a lot of debate about those terms. I'm going to use them interchangeably. And they said that four factors are associated with the rise of non-communicable diseases around the world in high, middle, and low-income countries. Tobacco use, unhealthy diet, insufficient physical activity, and the harmful use of alcohol. 
Uh, I'm going to focus today on three of those, although we might talk a little bit about uh, physical inactivity as well in the discussion period. And uh, I think, as most of you know, uh, chronic diseases are now the leading cause of death here in New York City, uh, in the United States, and increasingly around the world, certainly in the middle-income countries and rising fast in the low-income countries. And if we're going to achieve global, national, and local health goals of improving health and reducing inequalities in health, then we're going to have to do something about chronic diseases. And so one way that I think about it is these are the folks, uh, McDonald's and Pepsi and Bud and uh, the energy drinks, who are competing for the attention and the health behavior of the children and families and uh, adults that you serve. And the question is, who's going to win? If they win, your patients are at risk of early chronic diseases, premature death, and preventable illness. If you and we can figure out some ways to challenge the messages these companies are bringing, then your patients will have a better chance of uh, healthier lives, healthier, longer, uh, more satisfying lives. And so this question of how we compete with both their messages through marketing, uh, their political practices through campaign uh, contributions and lobbying are a decisive factor in influencing the health of the specific populations we serve here in Upper Manhattan and Lower Manhattan and, uh, and upstate New York, but also nationally and around the world. So this shows you the leading causes of death here in New York City from a few years ago. And not surprisingly, chronic diseases like heart disease, cancer, uh, respiratory diseases, and diabetes are the leading cause of death, the leading causes of death. And uh, these are precisely the conditions uh, most related to unhealthy food, uh, tobacco, and alcohol. And if we look at premature death, we again see these same conditions playing an important role. So just very clear quantitative indicators that if we're going to improve health here in New York City, we need to take on these chronic diseases. And this is, you know, for those of you who, who work in public health, a line like this is really staggering, this dramatic increase in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and shows the rise in these non-communicable diseases also in low and middle income countries. I do some work in South Africa, and South Africa is, is really afflicted by a quadruple burden of diseases, not only the you know, water and sanitation diseases that affect child uh, and maternal health, but also HIV, violence, and increasingly non-communicable diseases. And like many middle-income countries, they're being forced to confront you know, all four of these challenges simultaneously. And even in uh, developing countries, chronic diseases are rising more rapidly and in many places are a more important cause of death than the still important uh, infectious diseases. And these are also not only health problems, but economic problems. These are the global costs of smoking, obesity, and alcohol. And you can see that their costs are estimated at trillions of dollars. And, and that's also true in our communities. Chronic diseases impose a, a huge burden, a tax, on the productivity, particularly of low-income black and Hispanic communities. And figuring out ways to reduce that burden is an economic development strategy, a health strategy, and a human strategy. Now, the question comes up, why this increase in chronic diseases over the last you know, 30 or 40 years? And if we look back at sort of in the 70s that we see this beginning dramatic increase, first here in the United States and then around the world. The, the trends had started earlier that. And people offer four reasons, and all of them have some truth. So one is, you know, as infectious diseases declined, you got to die of something, and so it's chronic diseases. Uh, 
And the fallacy in that argument as a sole explanation is it doesn't explain those countries where infectious diseases have not gone down, like uh, sub-Saharan Africa and parts of uh, Southeast Asia, but still we see this increase in chronic diseases. So it couldn't be only that. Uh, the other explanation is with the increases in longevity that chronic diseases are diseases of older people, and that's why we're seeing the increase. The problem there is that doesn't explain, for example, the dramatic increases in diseases like diabetes, even among people in their second, third, and fourth decades of life. It used to be that we called type 2 diabetes adult onset diabetes, but now it's people in the second decade who are getting diagnosed. And we see other chronic diseases also that are taking a more uh, aggressive uh, and toxic form in earlier decades of life. Other people say this is the inevitable consequence of economic development, that that's the price of all the luxuries and the, uh, the, the good conditions that we've created, especially in high-income countries. But what that doesn't explain is the differences within high-income countries. And actually, here in the United States, in chronic diseases, we do much worse than other high-income countries, uh, for reasons that I'll talk about in a little bit. And so uh, it, it, it does not seem empirically to be the case that all high-income developed countries have similar high and growing rates of chronic diseases. And the most common explanation is it's unhealthy lifestyles. It's just that we're eating too much of the wrong food, drinking too much, uh, smoking too much, and if only we would take a little better care of ourselves, we wouldn't be having these problems. And again, of course there's some truth to that. Uh, and ultimately, it's people's decisions about what to put in their mouth or what to smoke or what to drink that influences their health. But that's led some people, and this quote from Tony Blair, the former prime minister of the UK, is a good example that essentially he says, this isn't a public health problem, it's a moral problem. And if only people weren't so ignorant, we wouldn't have this problem. I want to argue a different cause and to say that the primary modifiable cause of the increase in chronic diseases uh, around the world is the business and political practices of corporations. And that that is the underlying cause of the changes in lifestyle and health behavior. The social epidemiologists say, as you I'm sure heard, is we need to look for the cause of the causes. And so we need to ask, what's the cause of this change in lifestyle? And I think there are a few reasons that justify that approach. And so when we talk about corporate practices as being the primary modifiable cause of the increase in chronic diseases, and also, by the way, as I argue in my book, Lethal But Legal, of injuries, you know, firearm injuries, automobile injuries, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I find it helpful to think about corporations as entities, not uh, people, uh, Mitt Romney, but entities that have a behavior. And if we want to think about improving public health, let's think about the behavior or the practices of corporations and to what extent they need changing. And that thinking comes some from my training as a health educator. I was trained to look at what individuals do, smoke, drink, uh, eat unhealthy food, and how do you change that behavior. So. Uh, in my paradigm, I've tried to expand that and say, look, let's look at some organizations, including corporations, and what's their behavior. And so the practices that I'll be talking about in the next few minutes are their business practices, how they design products, how they advertise and promote them, how they distribute them at the retail level, how they decide what to charge for them, uh, and their policies around trading with other countries. Uh, I use the term business practices. And then we also need to look at their political practices, their lobbying, campaign contributions, media relations, their sponsored scientific research. You all read uh, in the last couple of weeks about Coca-Cola spending $120 million to, among other things, and I'll talk more about that later, encourage researchers to focus on the role of physical activity and obesity, uh, kind of as a way of taking attention away from their product and uh, philanthropy. Uh, Coca-Cola has also been generous with the American Academy of Family Practice, the American P Academy of Pediatrics, uh, the, uh, the College of Cardiology, and other 
professional organizations. So we need to understand what are the pathways by which these practices get to use, again, the term of social em epidemiologists, embodied, get under our skin, uh, turn into patterns of health and disease. And the numbers are daunting. These are uh, figures from the uh, CDC from about uh, 2005. And they show that each year, the products uh, that we're talking about here are associated with hundreds of thousands of deaths, hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. And to my mind, and of course not every one of these deaths is directly attributable to an industry practice, but to my mind it would constitute public health malpractice not to be looking at the behavior of corporations to understand this tremendous burden of uh, mortality and morbidity that we experience here in the United States. So what is it that corporations do that uh, translates into higher rates of chronic diseases? And these are examples of some of the behaviors, the practices of corporations that increase risk of chronic diseases. And so if we think of ourselves as educators, advocates, this is kind of our to-do list, that our goal over the next 10 years, 20 years, because we're talking about a long time perspective, our goal is to reduce these behaviors and to encourage behaviors that uh, more promote health and less harm it. Uh, AstroTurf groups are, by the way, the uh, industry response to grassroots activism. So they create groups. Uh, Coca-Cola created groups to oppose the soda tax and the portion size limitation uh, and paid for them, paid totally, lock, stock, and barrel for them to encourage people to write letters, send emails, uh, protest, and so on. So how did this happen? Uh, my analysis is that especially beginning in the 70s, in response to the successes of the consumer movement and the environmental movement and the women's movement and the civil rights movement of expanding people's rights and strengthening government protections of health, the people who ran corporations decided that they needed to respond to that, that their uh, control over our political and economic system was being challenged. And out of that response, uh, in, the, in, in my book, I talk about the Powell memo written by Lewis Powell, who at the time he wrote it was head of the Chamber of Commerce and later became a uh, Supreme Court justice. And he said, look, guys, talking to his fellow corporate executives, we need to fight back. We, we can't take this criticism from people like Ralph Nader sitting down. We need to organize ourselves, you know, develop organizations that can lobby, uh, raise money for campaign contributions. And there was a phenomenal increase in corporate activity in Washington in the following decades. And to my mind, what they've created is what I call the corporate consumption complex, uh, a network of consumer corporations, financial institutions, law firms, advertising agencies, the scientists they pay for, the media they pay for, that looks to develop and advance an ideology that says consumption is the solution to all our problems. Terrorism, consume more. That's how we get back to normal. Uh, hurricane, consume more. That's how we get to back to normal. Consumption and the economic development that is supported by uh, consumption is the solution to our economic problems. And they use a variety of uh, media to promote that message. And I, I make the uh, analogy to what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. He warned as he was leaving office in 1961 that we were threatened by the military industrial complex. There was a threat not only to our economy, but to our democracy. And I believe in the 21st century, it's the corporate consumption complex that represents that threat, not only to public health, but to our democracy and to the environment through its contribution both to pollution and to climate change. And understanding the mechanisms 
of how the corporate consumption complex works is a key task not only for us as health professionals but also as citizens for environmental activists and for people who are concerned about democracy and equality so these are some of the tenets of the corporate consumption ideology and what strikes many people in looking at these is they seem so reasonable and that's in part because we've been heard we've heard them so much and there's so much part of the dominant discourse that takes place on television and the media and conversations and congress and so on and it's these set of beliefs that corporations advance that justify and that make many people believe as maggie thatcher said there is no alternative and so these are some of the values that the corporate consumption complex promotes that increase chronic disease risk. Again, the images, these are tobacco executives testifying in the late 1990s that they have no, uh, they, they swore to tell the truth, the whole truth, and then they said there's no evidence that uh, nicotine is addictive. And then it turned out in their files 30 years ago that they knew that was the case. One small measure of uh, uh, gratification is that within two years all these guys were out of their jobs. Uh, but uh, because they had, uh, they had uh, threatened the profitability in the view of shareholders by you know, getting the tobacco industry into trouble. Uh, we'll talk more about the tobacco industry. And this is a, a Colt 45, uh, a malt liquor heavily promoted in African American communities uh, following a tradition of using alcohol to undermine uh, black communities from economic development uh, that dates back to the period of slavery. And Frederick Douglass had some very uh, telling things to say about the role of alcohol in maintaining slavery that is interesting to read you know, all these years later. And, and just two examples of this. This is uh, a Newport ad, Newport again, uh, using menthol cigarettes, marketing heavily to African Americans, and associating tobacco with pleasure Right? And, and one of the ways that advertisers are so effective is unlike us public health nerds, they don't talk about facts. They talk about feelings and emotions. And, and we need to learn from that. But here it is, the product most associated with preventable deaths in the United States and the world, and they're trying to associate it with pleasure. And the fact that so many people believe that is a tribute to their power and their skill. And here's Indra Nuri, the CEO of uh, PepsiCo, uh, uh, explaining that they have three different products, three different categories of products. Uh, good for you products that are healthy, Tropicana orange juice, water. Uh, better for you, not quite as good, you know, a little bit of sugar in them. Uh, and then fun for you, and that's Pepsi. And 80% of their profits come from their fun for you products. Uh, I call them the make you sicker quicker products. Uh, and Indra Nui argues that PepsiCo is a moral corporation because it gives people choices. And that, yes, it's true, they contribute to the epidemics of, uh, uh, of diabetes and obesity and certain forms of cancer around the world, but they're giving people choices. And even though most of their profits come from the unhealthy choices, it's a moral position. So this is uh, a Hardee's uh, thick burger, a monster burger. They call it Audacity and a Bun. And Hardee's put this out uh, in the, uh, about 10 years ago because they were losing market share to other fast food companies, and particularly to a segment critical to the fast food industry, young men. And so they put this out. They marketed it heavily. Uh, they said it's not a hamburger for tree huggers. And uh, they were remarkably successful. They, they regained market dominance uh, in the period that they advertised it heavily. Their share value went up 8%. But what was good for their bottom line was bad for public health. It put a particular uh, group already at high risk of cardiovascular disease at higher risk. And by the way, it has something like 1,200 calories and 47 grams of fat. And so this, what I call hyperconsumption, 
uh, the ideology of the corporate consumption complex, our health behaviors and lifestyles to, that contribute to premature death and preventable illness and injury. And so our role is to have a palatable response to hyperconsumption. So switching gears now, in the second part, what can we do about this? It's a very depressing picture uh, I've painted for us because their power is great and they reach a lot of people. Uh, but, and, and some people get discouraged by that. But in reality, uh, health professionals and public health folks have always taken on challenges like this. And so the questions we need to ask is, well, what can we do about it? And I want to talk about the different hats that you wear as clinicians and educators. And I know some of you are also teachers and researchers. Uh, I'll be very interested in hearing some of your thoughts about how you can take on these issues in those roles as well. You're also part of organizations, uh, the Institute, Mount Sinai, uh, Beth Israel, uh, and a variety of other organizations. Uh, many of you, and I know the Institute prides itself on this, are also community health advocates. You speak out for your patients and your communities. You're members of professional organizations, and also all of us are citizens, voters, taxpayers, excuse me, citizens or residents, uh, taxpayers, and some of us are parents. So we play multiple roles. And the question I'll try and answer in the next few minutes is what can we do in these different roles? So some people say, well, you're asking me to take on more than my job. Uh, and I say, no, this has always been our job. The CDC identified the, the 10 great public health achievements of the 20th century. And every one of those, uh, excuse me, six of those 10 involved changing the practices of businesses. So the Im impressive improvements we saw in health over the course of the 20th century, unfortunately more in the first half than the second half, came about as a result of health professionals, public health folks, reformers, social movements, uh, combining together. Think of the creation of the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, in 1906. Reform movements, Upton Sinclair, a novelist, uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, a president responding to public pressure. That's how we got safer food and drugs. So in your role as clinicians and educators, I think there's some very specific things you can do. And I know some of you are doing this, and the question is, how can you do it more? And again, because I've talked to some of your residents before and I've talked to other clinicians, people say, you know, you're, you're crazy, Nick. I have to see 30 patients in a session. How can I ever talk about these things? It doesn't fit. Well, when I first started doing uh, HIV work in the early years of the epidemic, we had the same discussions and people said, no, we can't talk about these things. And what we figured out over time through conversations between educators like me, clinicians, and activists, and thank you to the HIV activists who helped that to come about faster, we said, okay, let's say you only have 30 seconds to talk to someone about tobacco or alcohol, what are you gonna say? And let's say you have three minutes, and what are the signs you put up in your waiting room? Uh, and we need to break it down in that same way. We figured out how to do that around HIV, and we've seen some success around that. Now, much more important killers around the world, uh, we have to take it on in that same kind of way. And I think there's some compelling reasons for doing that. Uh, but also, it's not enough. It's not enough to talk to individuals and to try and change individual behavior, important as that is. And the reason for that is if all we're doing is changing individual behavior, we're a lot like that uh, superhero Sisyphus, rolling the rock up the hill, helping people, and you know, as someone who's been doing health education for a long time, it's really hard, as you probably know, to get people to stop smoking, eat less healthy food, uh, drink less, once they're uh, addicted or habituated or uh, patterned into those behaviors. And even if we're successful with the marketing of tobacco, alcohol, and unhealthy food, there are another million people who we need to change tomorrow. So it just doesn't make sense to have that be our only activity. We also need to lower that hill and, and maybe even get it downward so that the rock rolls down the hill instead of our having to push it up. And Tom Frieden talks about the pyramid of public health. 
and says the most effective public health actions, even though they're hard, are at the bottom of the pyramid, changing living conditions and socioeconomic conditions. And so we need to ask, how can we do that as well as the easier things like educating people and, you know, easy in quotes, uh, providing the clinical care that people need. You're also uh, staff members and organizations. How do you like that? And would that work well in your clinical office, you know, in your, in your uh, examining room or in your waiting room? Uh, and what are the things that you can do in your organization? Uh, we've been working with a health center in the Bronx to help make that uh, health center a soda-free zone. Uh, and they're voluntarily asking both staff not to bring or consume soda at the center and patients not to bring them in. And is that something you could do here? Is that something that could happen at Mount Sinai, in your uh, offices uh, in, in Harlem, and in your other practices? Uh, and for those strategies to work, you need to engage the patients uh, and the young people uh, in bringing about those changes. So here are some more posters. The, uh, uh, the, the one of the Marlboro man looking at his dead horse who died of secondhand exposure to smoke. Uh, Corporate Accountability International has tried to, uh, has, has led a national campaign uh, going to shareholder meetings at McDonald's. Uh, asking for retiring Ronald, saying that it's essentially an unethical business practice to promote unhealthy, obesogenic, diabetogenic food to children to get them to nag their parents to take them there. And the uh, absolute vodka ad, I think, speaks for itself. You're also community health advocates. Uh, and already many of you are active uh, in the communities where you work. What else could you do? Who are the partners who could help to take on the tobacco, alcohol, and food industry? Who's already doing that work? And what do you have to offer that could help them to do it better, deeper, stronger? And this requires a kind of uh, intensive investigation of the community and the organizations that you're already partnering with. And again, in the future, I'd be very happy to talk through with some of you how some of that work could happen. These are some images. We, this summer, uh, recruited and trained a group of 17 young people, uh, 13 to 18-year-olds, from East Harlem and South Bronx youth organizations to be youth counter-marketers. And they're now developing counter-marketing campaigns around fast food, soda, and candy that they will take to their youth organizations, schools, uh, health professionals, and other organizations to share what they've learned about marketing practices. And our goal is three or four years from now, if you walk across 116th Street or down 3rd Avenue, you'll be as likely to encounter their messages uh, challenging uh, Pepsi, McDonald's, and Mars uh, about the health consequences of those products. And uh, this is a candy bar uh, wrapper they designed, and I don't know if you can read it. Uh, their Coke poster says, Open Death, and their McDonald's poster says, uh, I'm hating it. And, and we found it was very easy to engage kids in uh, analyzing the messages companies were giving, and because so many of them had experiences with diabetes and heart disease and cancer in their own families, they were very, there was an emotional connection to taking this up. And there are other groups around the country developing marketing campaigns, some of them quite sophisticated. Uh, another story that I think illustrates this approach, in the uh, 1990s, uh, Reynolds Tobacco Company wanted to uh, market a new cigarette aimed at African Americans called Uptown uh, in Philadelphia. But a coalition formed uh, called Stop Uptown Coalition that included health organizations, church groups, uh, civil rights groups, and others. And they said uh, no to, Re to Reynolds. They said, no, you're not going to do this in our community. We're already at high enough health risk. And what they said is, you know, you say, Reynolds, that individuals have a choice. Well, we say back our community is a choice, and we say no. And reframing the issue from individual choice to uh, 
pay attention to the messages from uh, those promoting hyperconsumption to community choice to protect its residents against chronic diseases, I think is a very powerful message. And we ought to be exploring how we can do that, both at the individual and the community level. And you're all members of professional organizations. These are people in uh, Contra Costa County, members of the American Academy of Family Practice, uh, burning their cards and saying, because uh, AFP accepted money from Coca-Cola, they didn't want to be members anymore. And for those of you who read the New York Times story about Coca-Cola, you can see Coke contributed more than $2 million over the last few years to uh, the Academy. And other professional organizations are developing conflict of interest rules. I think uh, if you followed what happened in the American Psychological Association, slightly different set of facts where they were involved in developing guidelines for torture and supervising torture sessions, what a, a blow it was to the credibility of that professional organization. So when our organizations compromise our professional integrity, it damages not only them, but us and our credibility in the future. So I think we really have a, uh, an opportunity and an obligation to change the practices of our organizations when they take wrong steps. And finally, as I said, as citizens, voters, residents, taxpayers, parents, uh, we can take action around some of these things. Some of you may remember, uh, I think it was in 2006, uh, an, uh, a number of East Harlem and Puerto Rican groups objected when Coors put a Puerto Rican flag on their beer can and tried to promote drinking Coors uh, as a Puerto Rican ethnic uh, behavior. And many uh, East Harlem residents and Puerto Ricans were offended by that. And I think that's an example of linking some of these issues to ethnic identity and to protecting uh, a culture against its uh, misuse by people who look to market it. And so I think as we begin to forge uh, 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 an alternative ideology, an alternative set of beliefs, we need to look for some ideas that will pull together the work we do, the work that tobacco folks do, the work that democracy, climate change, and others do. And here are some suggestions for what some of these ideas might be. And I would be interested to hear your thoughts today or afterwards about what's the relevance of these ideas to your day-to-day -day jobs and how can you integrate them into what you do as clinicians, as professionals, as uh, voters and taxpayers. And it's only when collectively we can have a response to the uh, ubiquitous messages of the uh, of the disease promoters, of the hyperconsumption advocates, that we'll be able to engage people in a way of thinking of alternatives. So this is a summary list of some of the things that I believe health professionals can do. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts about uh, how and what it would take, what the organizations that support you would need to do to enable you to take on some of these tasks. And so I think that really the bottom line is that our job as health professionals, as researchers, as teachers, is to give out the message that there is another world possible. And that uh, the ubiquity of the messages from people who are promoting uh, behaviors and lifestyles that contribute to disease is a characteristic of a particular time and place. People made those decisions, and people can unmake those decisions. But it's not going to happen by itself. It's going to happen when together we figure out a way to do that. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your responses and questions.